Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can gain access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. My guest today is Dr. Michael Sanchez. Michael Sanchez is a criminal justice scholar with over 20 years experience in the criminal justice system. He's been a detention officer, booking officer, patrol officer, patrol sergeant, administrative supervisor, training coordinator, firearms instructor, investigator, lieutenant, deputy chief of police, international police officer with the UN in Kosovo, and regional commander for the UN police in Haiti. He has a master peace officer license in the state of Texas, a bachelor's degree in police science from Ottawa University, a master's degree in criminal justice administration from Utica College, and a PhD in business administration with a specialization in criminal justice from North Central University. He's been teaching at Utica College since 2012 and is also a full-time lecturer for the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley in the criminal justice department. So I can honestly say this was the most interesting conversation I've had about policing in my life. And this conversation took place many months ago, when the death of George Floyd and the subsequent protests and riots were in the foreground of everyone's minds. So I was very excited to talk to someone who had both academic knowledge of policing and practical experience with it. We start by talking about the difference between policing in America and international policing, Then we talk about the steady stream of videos of unarmed Americans getting killed by cops. We talk about Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Rayshard Brooks. We talk about the mechanics of shooting and why cops tend to fire so many bullets. We talk about the difference between tasers and guns. We talk about how to hold bad cops accountable. We talk about qualified immunity. We talk about why America is unique with regard to the issue of police killings. We talk about how police get trained and whether it makes sense to use mental health professionals instead of police in certain cases. And the most interesting part of the conversation occurs toward the end, where we have a disagreement about what level of risk a cop should be expected to take on. So without further ado, Dr. Michael Sanchez. Okay, Dr. Michael Sanchez, thank you so much for coming on my show. My pleasure. So can you give people your background as a police officer in, you know, in multiple different respects uh, and as an academic uh, before we get started? Sure. Uh, I started my police career back in 1988. Uh, I have over 25 years of of experience in, in all aspects of the criminal justice system. I've worked in jails, detention, policing. I worked in every capacity from patrolman to deputy chief of police in the United States. Uh, I served as the assistant project manager or assistant warden of an immigration detention center. And I served four years as an international police officer for the United Nations. Uh, I served three years in Kosovo where I reached the level of uh, director of administration for the UN police. And I was a regional commander for the UN police in Haiti. I was actually in Haiti when the earthquake hit in 2010. Uh, That was a unique experience. Uh, I finished my uh, bachelor's degree with Ottawa University in police science. I have a master's degree in criminal justice administration from Utica College in New York. And I have a PhD in business administration with a specialization in criminal justice from North Central University out of Arizona. Uh, I I am published. I have a few book chapters out and I have one uh, research monograph book out about the role of culture in UN policing. And I currently teach criminal justice at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Hmm. So when were you in Kosovo? I was in Kosovo from December of 05 to December of 08. And where were you chief of police? I was deputy chief of police in Indian Lake, which is down here in South Texas. Okay. So yeah, you have a huge well of policing, very different policing experiences to draw from, which is great. I think a lot of 
you know, civilians in the past six months or so are in the position of speculating what it's like to be a police officer, uh, of seeing videos of unarmed Americans getting shot and killed or videos of protesters getting beaten up um, and also videos of cops getting beaten up uh, and often video clips that start the story in the middle. And I think many people, at least I've noticed, there's a, a conspicuous lack of police voices that I hear if I'm just paying attention to the op-ed pages and, you know, the talking heads, which sets up a situation where I, I think it's very easy to to sort of play backseat cop as someone who's never done the job. And I'm always aware of how my ignorance about the job can be, you know, informing my opinion on on these videos or on the wider problem of pol police brutality or racism in policing or racism in, in the justice system. So I think it's really useful to get someone who's been on the other side of it just to you know, fill the gaps in people's knowledge about these issues. So I'm very excited uh, to talk with you. Um, first, can you talk about the difference between policing in America and, and international policing with the UN? Yeah, international policing, it was the greatest experience of my life. Uh, in Kosovo, we were basically trying to bring stability to a war-torn region to develop a, an organic police force out of the ashes of Yugoslavia. And this is, when I was in the UN police in Kosovo, uh, the UNMIC police consisted of 2,190 police officers from 47 countries. So I've lived an incredible multicultural existence. I've worked with police officers from all over the world. And your goal, the goal there was to bring democratic police reform to Kosovo and to help develop their police force into a modern police force. And, you know, the, the stakes in international policing were so much higher. Uh, I tell my students that when you make a mistake in America, okay, maybe you get sued, maybe you get suspended. You make a mistake in an international peacekeeping mission, you start a war. So the stake can be much higher and you have to be much more uh, careful about everything you do and the ramifications of each decision you make. So, so is the dynamic different at all because you're you're presumably exercising soft power in the case of being an international police officer wh where you don't have the, the the teeth of a national or local law to to back you up it actually depends on where you are when i was in haiti haiti was already a sovereign nation and that's what's called a uh, development and capacity building mission the un was in haiti to just help the Haitian police develop and improve, Kosovo, the UNMIC police in Kosovo actually had executive authority. So the UN police for the time that we were there had the power to investigate, had the power to arrest. So we did have the hard police powers. Yeah. So let, let's talk about the the American context. So you ha, was all of your, was everything from patrolman to deputy police chief in South Texas for you? Uh, I did work a little bit in Virginia, but all, the vast majority of it is South Texas. Yes. Mm. So when you see uh, a video of an unarmed American getting killed by a cop, how does your perspective as a cop lead you, if at all, to see it differently than the typical civilian might? Okay. Um, I actually am a, a master firearms instructor and I teach a lot of use of force, deadly force. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you is what I teach police officers. Just because somebody doesn't have a weapon in his hand doesn't mean he's unarmed. If you're a police officer and I have you on your back and I have you by your collar, and I'm banging your head on the cement, am I unarmed? 
because I'm hitting your head against the weapon and not the weapon against your head makes the sidewalk no less a weapon. Um, there's something in the use of force called disparity of force. If you have a four foot nine female police officer trying to arrest a six foot seven, 350 pound football player, does he have the ability to kill her with his bare hands? So it's not just that someone doesn't have a weapon in their hands. It's a little more complicated than that. Uh, we had a, a constable here in the 90s killed because three men who were much smaller than him tackled him to the ground and beat him to death. So that's force of numbers. That's another disparity of force. So when I look at it, I look at it in the totality of the circumstances as to whether there was a disparity there that made escalation of force reasonable. And a lot of times it's not. Mm. But the mere fact of them being unarmed is touted as, uh, well, the police had to have screwed up. He was unarmed. And the best, uh, all right, I'll give you a scenario that I, that I tell everybody. If a police officer shoots an unarmed man in the back from 100 feet away, is he wrong? And most people would say yes. If the police officer was answering a call on the second floor of an apartment building and he heard a scream in the, in the alley and sees a man choking a woman to death and the officer yells and he, maybe he throws his baton at the man, but the man continues on. And the officer knows by the time he gets down the stairs, out the building, down to the alley, the woman's going to be dead. Now he shoots the man. Is the officer wrong? Just because the man was unarmed? So it takes... Everybody asks me when the video comes out, were they right or wrong? Okay, first of all, you have to wait and find out what the facts are. And second of all, you have to look at it based on the totality of the circumstances. Third, we in this country, we like to have binary choices. You know, politically, people want the magic button that's going to solve a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And one of my mantras is there are no uh, simple solutions to complicated problems. But we want the simple answer. And a lot of times, it's not that the police were wrong or the police were right. Some things they did right, some things they did wrong. The, a, great, a great example would be, be the Breonna Taylor case. Now, whether or not no-knock warrant should happen is a whole other issue. But the officers were following their department policy. When the sergeant entered the apartment, uh, Taylor's boyfriend was absolutely justified in shooting at the police officer. Um, the, the, knock, the knock and bang, I don't really agree with because you're not going to hear somebody say police search warrant. You're going to hear your door being broken down. Right. Or you, or, or you just might hear muffled voices or you might or you, or you might not. You might hear the word police and simply not trust that it's in fact the police because it could be an imposter. Yeah, there's, you know, if I was going to rob somebody, I would come in the house saying police because you're going to make them hesitate. Right. But the average person woke up by their door crashing down in the middle of the night. It's reasonable for him to defend his home. Now, it was reasonable for the officer to fire back. Firing six shots, that's kind of high normal. But I wouldn't say it was ridiculously excessive. Where they went off the rails was the other two officers fired 26 shots through the windows. So they don't have a clear identification of the suspect. They don't have the elements of deadly force. So to my mind, that was incredibly reckless. The officer was right. Taylor's boyfriend was right. But the officers firing from the outside were wrong. So a situation, sometimes it's completely right or completely wrong. George Floyd was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. There's no mitigating factors in that. But uh, I don't think people are willing to accept a mixed answer. I, I want to get to the George Floyd case in a moment, but let's linger a bit on the Breonna Taylor case. Uh, my, my last reading of, of the reporting on that was that there were two officers coming in from the door and then the third officer shooting crazily from the window outside who, you know, charges of reckless endangerment, endangerment were, were brought against. And uh, it, it seems as if uh, I, I, I think I'm right about this, that the, the bullet that ended up killing Brianna was not from the, sh the first cop that got shot in the leg, but the cop, you know, very close to him also coming in through the door. Um, the reporting that I saw 
was that only the sergeant made entry. The other two were firing through the windows. And it wasn't the, the sergeant shot that hit Brianna Taylor. There that, that was the killing shot. The fatal shot was fired from outside the apartment. Oh, so, so I think we're agreeing about everything except m- my impression was that the sergeant made entry into the apartment and then there was someone just behind him outside the threshold of the door also shooting. That's possible. I, like I said, I, if I could see the official reports, that's one thing. Yeah. You know, you look at the reporting and the reporting's all over the place and, and I have to kind of use my experience to kind of sift through mm. what probably happened when you get a dozen different uh, scenarios. Yeah. But no matter how you slice it, uh, I didn't. I don't think the sergeant did anything wrong. I I would have to look at the police department's policy to know if they authorize shooting inside from outside of a building into a building blindly. Mm. Um, the problem is this was a terrible tragedy, and the screams to charge the police officers with first degree murder is an emotional one. Because that case would not meet the elements of a first degree murder. Maybe reckless homicide for the person because he was shooting from the outside. But then did he see Mr. Walker from the outside or was he just firing uh, what we call sympathetic fire? Uh, It happens a lot where an officer shows up on a scene and you're you're shooting. So I start shooting. I don't know what you're shooting at, but I'm shooting because you're shooting. So did they just start shooting because they heard shots or did they actually see somebody with a gun? Right. So there's Um, still a lot lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, agreed. Um, I want to talk about, you know, a, a lot of the, at least part of the outrage from people watching this from the outside pertains to how many bullets are fired in these scenarios. And having spoken, I've never fired a gun myself, but having spoken to some people who have, I increasingly get the sense that we don't really understand what the number of round fires translates into. So can you, can you explain what does it mean for someone to fire three rounds as opposed to six rounds as opposed to nine and where, what do you see from the point of view of someone who works, works you know, in this? What number seems justified based on what level of threat coming a cop's way? Well, the application of deadly force doesn't just have to be justifiable. It has to be proportional and reasonable. So if a man uh, approaches you with a knife, if you shoot him 50 times, that's not proportional and that's not reasonable. Okay. Why officers shoot so many rounds is, is, in my opinion, a combination of things. I actually have the, the good fortune of having started my police career with a revolver, which means when I worked, I had 18 bullets on my entire person. You're not looking to unload on a person when you have a revolver. So what we were trained to do was draw and fire to bang, bang, and then come to what we call low ready and reassess if the, the target's still a threat. If they're still uh, executing that threat, then you fire another shot and you reevaluate. So why they're shooting so many rounds is a couple of different things. Uh, Sometimes it's fear. They panic and they just keep shooting. Uh, Sometimes it's a lack of training in the use of instinct shooting and they do what's called spray and pray, which is hose down the area and hope you hit the suspect. Uh, And the third is really kind of a cultural thing where it's a, it's a statement of power, let's say. Um, But it's not reasonable and it depends on what the suspect is doing. Okay. If let's say I have my off duty weapon and I'm at the mall and a guy comes in and starts shooting with a fully automatic AK 47 I'm probably going to shoot him five or six times because his weapon is so much outclass as mine that I have to put him down hard to keep me from getting killed. Otherwise, I can't protect everybody else in the mall. Mm. If uh, a person comes in and charges with me with a knife, I might fire one time. If he doesn't go down, I'll fire again if he keeps coming. So each individual case is different. 
you get Laquan McDaniel where they fired 16 shots at a kid with a knife. There's no way to justify that. Uh, to me, firing 26 rounds from outside the apartment, uh, that's not proportional. And to my mind, that's not a reasonable application of force. To, when you apply deadly force, it's not a switch. You don't flick it on and then shoot all your bullets at the guy. Your goal is you don't shoot to kill, you shoot to stop. Your goal is to stop the threat that is either putting your life or somebody else's life in jeopardy. Once that threat has been stopped, you stop shooting. You can see uh, some of the videos. I use a lot of videos when I teach use of force. There's one video of a police officer that pulls a man over, asks the guy for his driver's license. The guy says, oh, okay, and reaches into the car. And he reaches into the car to get his, his wallet because he left it on the console, but the officer starts shooting. And the last shot, the guy has his hands up and the officer is still firing, mm. which means the officer stopped thinking. He went on autopilot. Yeah. Um, it, it, the, the thing about this conversation is that, you know, of the roughly thousand or so Americans that get shot and killed every year by cops, you can find every possible scenario on every side of the spectrum. You can find cops emptying the clip into people that are face down on the ground. You can find cops that didn't take enough shots and ended up getting hurt or killed as a result and everything in between. And um, it's it can be hard to predict based on a limited clip from the middle of an interaction or the very tail end of an interaction where on, on the spectrum that falls. So in the Breonna Taylor case, six rounds from the, from the officer who himself got shot, that can still seem like far too many to people. It, 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 people can think, well, why didn't you just shoot once? It. Now we get into dynamics that neither one of us had the answers to. How far apart were they? Was his gun still up? Did he fire one shot and continue aiming it down the hallway? Did he drop it down to his side? Were they firing around corners? You know, the, now you get into, and this is why I'm hesitant to say he fired too many shots. If he fired a shot and still had his weapon up and pointed at the officer, the officer's reasonable to think that more shots are coming. Um, so I couldn't really answer that with any sort of accuracy without knowing the finer details because what a deadly force decision comes down to is what we call the totality of the circumstances. And when it happens, I don't think the average person realizes that these decisions come in microseconds and you have to take everything into account. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example from my own career. And, it, and this incident actually changed the way I see things. I was working with a, a partner of mine when I was the deputy sheriff in Virginia in the 80s, and we were at a Hardee's. And we're talking to a suspect, and we had the suspect in a triangle. So I'm looking at the suspect, and Paul is in my periphery on my left because we have the guy triangulate. As I'm talking to the suspect, and this is 3 o'clock in the morning in the parking lot. Out of nowhere, I see a hand enter my field of vision, grab Paul's gun and take it out of the holster. I spun around and I drew and I'm an advanced shooter. So actually, as I'm coming up with a revolver, I'm already pulling the trigger. And as I'm coming up and I'm pulling the trigger, when I get up to this height, the, su the suspect's eyes went. And I stopped because just that shift in his eyes changed the totality of the circumstances for me. And when I stopped, the hammer of my revolver was all the way back when I recognized him. It was a friend of my partner playing a joke on him. Yeah. And Paul said the whole thing, he felt tug blur and I was there. He said it happened that fast. To me, it felt like it took four seconds. But Paul said it, had, it couldn't have been more than a half a second. And of all the things I've been through, that is actually the one that will keep me up at night because I came thousands of a second from making a widow and two orphans over a joke. Now, by the rules that govern police, I would have been right. But being right and living with it are two very different things. So these things happen incredibly fast. And you have to be able to 
continue thinking. As some of the officers you're talking about who shoot too many times, stop thinking. They flick the switch, they go on autopilot, and they start shooting. Yeah, that's an, that's an incredible story. Um, there's a lot of directions we can go here, but so another common thought that a lot of people must have is if the goal is to shoot to stop rather than to shoot to kill, why not just shoot them in the legs? It's a, you know what? I get this question all the time and the answer isn't what people think it is. We teach police to shoot center mass because it's the safest place to shoot for everybody else. If I'm put in a position where I have to apply deadly force, my greatest responsibility is to everybody else in the area. And I'll give you a very good example. There was a, I want to say 2014, there was a constable in Pennsylvania who was serving an eviction. The man he was evicting arrives at the front door with a rifle and points it at the officer. So the officer fires one shot. Now, the officer was probably aiming center mass, but the, the shot went through the suspect's arm and killed his 12-year-old daughter. Oof. This is why we don't shoot for the leg. First of all, under stress, a leg is a hard thing to hit or a shoulder or the brachial nerve or the elbow or the gun out of his hand. Um, have you ever had a real adrenaline dump? Uh, yeah, like almost being hit by a car in New York City and... Um or being followed, being, being changed. Yeah, a bit, definitely. When my first one was when that guy grabbed Paul's gun. And I remember lowering my hammer and I just got my gun in the holster and I started shaking and that's adrenaline. Mm. So imagine under the adrenaline of being in a shootout, I'm supposed to aim for his leg. And if I miss the leg or the bullet goes through the flesh of the leg and doesn't hit the bone and ricochets and hits a three-year-old, who's responsible? Yeah. So we teach center mass because this is the largest, safest place to shoot to where you won't get over penetration or you won't miss. Same concept with shooting at the gun. Guns are made of metal. If I shoot at the gun and it ricochets and hits a three-year-old, I'm responsible for that. So let, let's talk about tasers. Have you ever, uh, have you ever used your taser? Did you, did you have tasers? Not, not in my day. Tasers came out when I started going to the UN and I haven't actually used one. Mm. I think taser is a great tool. Tasers don't always work. Um, I know officers that used, uh, before we had pepper spray, we had CN gas, uh, and I know an officer who maced somebody and then stood back and waited for this guy to, I guess, fall down on the ground and handcuff himself. Sometimes they don't always work. There's cases where tasers don't work on people that are severely hopped up on drugs. Yeah, I've seen videos of, of people getting tased three and four times and it seeming to not phase them. Right. Uh, that could it, it could be that the taser wasn't fully charged. There could be other issues. It could be drugs, but nothing works 100% of the time. Mm. I think tasers are an excellent tool, but even a taser can be overused. Uh, you see a police officer who the tasers fall in the use of force continuum where a baton falls. So if I'm justified in hitting you with a baton, I'm justified in tasing you. But you see cases where a, a kid in school won't comply with what the officer says, so the officer tases the kid. Or even a suspect on the street, tell them sit down on the curb. They don't sit down on the curb. You tase them. If you envision applying the taser like hitting them with a baton, if I tell you sit down and you don't sit down, am I justified in hitting you with a baton? I would say no. So because it doesn't cause permanent injury, in most cases, it, it could be over overused. I've also heard some people say that the taser should not be so um, so kind of blithely called non-lethal because it actually there's a small but you know not not infinitesimally small chance that it kills you either if you have a pre-existing condition or if you just consider the fact that it makes your whole body stiff 
And then you go, you can go down on the pavement or on a curb head first and crack your head open or break your neck and die instantly. You, you actually hit on one of my pet peeves. Uh, I'm, on, I'm an instructor in specialty impact munitions, which is uh, bean bags and rubber bullets and that sort of thing. And it grates my nerves when people call those less than lethal. Mm. Bean bags, tasers, none of those are less than lethal. They're less lethal. You can still kill somebody with a rubber bullet. It happened in Kosovo when I was there. Uh, two people in a riot got shot in the temple with a rubber bullet and it killed them. Yeah, a taser could create circumstances if it doesn't directly, like you said, if the person starts to move and they can strike their head and get a skull fracture or something, nothing is completely non-lethal. They are less lethal. Mm. So did you see the the case of Rayshard Brooks in in Atlanta, I believe from a few months ago where they were trying to make a, an arrest at a drive through The drive through called them for, for some reason. And, and this guy is beating on the cop, grabs the taser, and then runs away from the cop. But as he's running away, turns around and shoots the taser at the cop. So at, he, he's both running away and attacking the cop at the same time. And then the cop open fires. What was your impression of that video, if you, if you remember it? Yeah, that one. And there was one in South Carolina where the officer shot the shot at the guy like eight times and the guy was running away. Mm -hmm. And the officer's story was he grabbed my taser. And this is a, a great question because this is some of the hairs that have to be sliced here. OK, if I am confronting you one on one and you get my taser, you have the ability to incapacitate me, take my weapon and kill me. Right. Taser is a one shot weapon. If there's two officers and you get my taser, can you take out both of us with the taser? No. So with one officer, I may be justified in shooting because you can incapacitate me with that taser. When it's multiple officers, he can't take out everybody with a taser. So if he's running away, once he fires that taser, he's for all practical purposes unarmed because the taser has already fired its, its cartridge. Yeah. It's um yeah, it's it's really tough because I I often find myself in the position of defending police officers in these scenarios because not not because they don't make deadly mistakes but because it seems like sometimes you're in a position where you're going to work every day like all of us expecting to come home in one piece, but the nature of your work is such that there could be a scenario where either you do it 100% correctly or you're a murderer or you're, you know, you're considered a murderer by the general public and there's no gray area where you violated a department policy, um, you know, did something you shouldn't have and get get punished in a way that is, but, but that doesn't, you know, rise to murder or even criminal punishment. And it seems people have a very difficult time admitting that a cop could be a bad cop. He could be a racist cop even, um, but not a murderer that should rot in prison for murder. That, that's, I think, the where a lot of these things fall. I, I think the problem we have with the current dialogue on this subject is that you basically have two poles. Everything the cops do is right. Every one the cops shoot, the cop needs to go to prison. Neither one of those are true. Um, I can tell you from my own career, when I teach deadly force to cops, one of the things I tell them is what makes the job challenging is that you have the power to decide whether or not to take a human life and your margin of error is zero. Mm. You can't be wrong. Take, take the incident I, I told you about. I had literally one fourth of a second to split a thousand hairs and make a decision that can be picked apart by experts and judges and lawyers for the next six months. That's incredibly challenging, but I, this is what I accepted and this is what I signed up for. 
And that has to be understood as well. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about accountability. I think another, another thing that makes many people angry is the sense that police officers routinely go unpunished when they do do things that are unambiguously overstepping bounds. And I think this is a point that I, I tend to agree with. If, even if you don't pay attention to the cases that make headlines, if you just you know, chase down local news stories about cops that shot somebody in the back, you know, it, it's very rare. It's, it does happen, but it's very rare to see that this, sh this shooting was ruled unjustified um, the cop was immediately fired or fired after review. The, the more common story is the shooting was ruled justi justified and no charges were brought. What's your sense of how effective our accountability um, system is right now? I, I honestly don't think that you can get full objectivity from a department that investigates itself. And that's not a knock on internal affairs investigators, because you can be the most ethical, call it like I see it, investigator. But once your report starts going up the chain of command, at some level, they start thinking about uh, how's this going to look to the public? What's this going to cost us in a lawsuit? If the police come out and say, yeah, that shooting was absolutely wrong, they're looking at or capitulating before it ever happens to a major lawsuit. So, how can a department? be completely objective when it makes that kind of decision. And so I, I think uh, maybe the state police should have a special unit that investigates that sort of thing. So at least there's some separation uh, and there's more objectivity. You can't really have the FBI investigate it because at the local level, it has to do with what, whether you're following your department's policies and your state laws. And the feds don't, aren't really tied into that. So I think I would say I would I would suggest the state police investigate. But there's there's this idea of giving the officer the benefit of the doubt. And what you were talking about. Uh, I've seen a lot of people talk about we need to improve selection for police officers, and that's actually. Looking at it the wrong way. Policing has an incredible amount of power. And although it's attributed to Lincoln, I actually think it was said about Lincoln. One of my favorite quotes is, any man can withstand adversity. If you want to test a man's character, give him power. Mm. When I have you on the side of the road and you're at my mercy, I can search your car or I can arrest you. You know, that's a lot of power. And people respond to power differently, just like they respond to fear differently. I have a 22-year-old uh, applicant who worked at McDonald's and got a bachelor's degree in college, he's never experienced real power. So there's no way to predict how he's going to respond to the power and authority of being a police officer. So you can only do so much in the recruitment process. Where the process fails is in the year or two after they get hired. Um, it's not robust enough to weed out people. And this is where police unions probably cause a lot of trouble because they support, they will fight tooth and nail against any termination, whether it's correct or not. Take, take Derek Chauvin. Okay. He had what, 17 complaints against him throughout his career. If he had been nixed at year two or year three, when the first complaint came, then you, it doesn't build into a George Floyd. Uh, some people panic and don't have the presence of mind to keep thinking. They, they have to be weeded out. Some people abuse their authority. They have to be weeded out. There is no training that is going to train out a character trait like abusing authority. I can give you tools to apply your authority, but if you choose to abuse it, I can't train that out of you. So I think the problem is that they need to be weeded out the first time that they show those proclivities. And this actually has an exponential effect in policing. Uh, at, at that George Floyd scene, Chauvin was, I think, a 17-year veteran. 
And rookie cops look to the veterans for guidance and for example, and I want to be like him. And so what they do is through their example, they they hijack the police culture and they make the rookies think that these excesses are the right way to do things because they've never gotten in trouble for it. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting point that I had never heard before. I remember reading something in the Wall Street Journal about, I think, a former chief of police in New York who was stressing how important it was not to hire your problems. But it, it occurs to me your point, you know, makes a lot of sense. It, it actually is difficult to predict who becomes, you know, the type of person you become when you have power. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the George Floyd case. There might be a bit of distance between how you're describing it and how how I've how I've been thinking about it lately at, at least. There are there's there's one crucial fact that 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 changed how I looked at it and I, I want to be careful about this because I don't know if it's a fact yet. I think it has to it has to be, you know, corroborated by by multiple journalistic outlets for me to, you know, to totally say that this is a fact. But I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen pictures of a handbook alleged to be the training manual given to to uh, cops in that department, which shows a recommended hold of the knee on the neck for cases of excited, quote unquote, excited delirium. And that combined with the the full George Floyd video, which didn't come out until several months after, which shows, um, you know, a, a man that is, you know, highly claustrophobic, probably as a result of, an, you know, a drug and fentanyl, and combined with um, shock at being arrested, who who actually asked the cop to take him out of the back of the cop car and said, "Please put me on the ground." So that that much is definitely fact, and I think I should just be cautious in in saying it may may turn out in the final analysis to be a fact that those cops were trained to put the knee on the neck in in such scenarios. And conditional on that being true, it would seem to change my my view of what Chauvin did there. What do you make of that? Okay. Um, first of all, you remember the Rodney King beating? I wasn't alive, actually, but I, I, I do I do know him. Yes, yes. And the reason that none of the police officers wound up going to jail was because of the way the policy was written. And I think the policy said something like the officer will continue to use force until the suspect complies. So as long as he's not doing what they tell him, they kept beating him. Um, If that if everything you said is true, I'm going to tell you what I tell a lot of rookie officers. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because I can kneel on George Floyd's neck when it's obvious he's not struggling, he's not kicking, he's not flailing doesn't mean I should. Um, you know, Floyd was difficult in, in the video, but he wasn't angry. He wasn't aggressive. He wasn't threatening. He was scared. And, you know, you, you should have to, you should find better ways to deal with somebody who's acting out of fear than what they did. And, you know, I, 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 I know that situation from the inside. And I know what was happening was he was teaching George Floyd a lesson. Um, I, I, like I said, even if he was kicking and flailing, then secure his feet, hog time if you have to. But in, in the use of force, when they're taught baton, you're taught not to swing at the neck because the neck is a red zone. If you swing at somebody's neck with a baton, that constitutes deadly force. Yeah. But kneeling on a neck, is okay. And, and it brings up a good point. And, and I hear this a lot. And that's 
the the say people say, well, if George Floyd was saying I can't breathe, it means he can breathe because he's saying it. And if you are being choked with a carotid choke, meaning the blood is being restricted to your brain, you feel like you can't breathe because your brain is not getting oxygen and your brain is saying, hey, breathe, get us some oxygen. So you can have restricted blood flow to the brain and you're moving air in your lungs, but, but blood uh, oxygen isn't getting to your brain. Mm -hmm. So it feels like you can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And that's why people in that type of a hold or in a carotid choke hold say, I can't breathe. Right. Um, so do you have an opinion on qualified immunity? Have you thought about this at all? Oh, a lot. I actually, I'll give him his props. I have a, a colleague at UTRGV named Dr. Otu, who came up with an idea a long time ago that I think actually it's time has come. And what he proposed was getting rid of a qualified immunity. Can you just, sorry, can you briefly explain for, for listeners what it is? Sure. Qualified immunity means if I am on duty acting, acting under color of authority, following the law and following department policy, I can't be sued individually. So it protects police officers from like losing their house in a lawsuit because they said the wrong thing to somebody. Uh, but what, what this professor proposed was doing away with qualified immunity and requiring police officers to keep a certain amount of personal liability insurance, like a doctor's malpractice insurance. Now, if you, if you modernize that idea, let's say uh, every police officer has to have $5 million of personal liability insurance. Whatever the mean cost of that is, is paid for by the city. If you get a couple of lawsuits and you get a couple of excessive forces and your rates go up, everything above the mean comes out of your pocket. If you do a lot of years with no trouble and no, no cases, no lawsuits, and your rate goes down, that differential goes to you. This puts it in the officer's control. And this solves another problem that police officers hate. I know because when I was a cop, I hated to see this happen. Somebody accuses you of uh, false arrest or excessive force. And the city, rather than pay $100,000 to defend you, will give the person $50,000 to go away. But it makes it look to the public like you were guilty. So if you had your own insurance, then it would be in your insurance company's best interest to defend you or all the officers are going to pick another insurance company. Yeah, so I, I've thought about this idea as well. Um, but my friend Noam Dorman pointed out to me that what this could amount to is a, a pay cut for cops, for cops who live in the highest crime, roughest neighborhoods where, you know, the same quality of cop is likely to incur more violations. Um, you know, the, the, the places where policing is ironically most important would become less attractive and the, the nice, easy suburbs you know, where it's easy not to violate. What, what do you make of that objection? Well, that's why I say that the rate should be the mean of the cost and that should be covered by the city. So if you're, yeah, I, I for sure, you know, small town Texas has a different uh, rate of complaints and lawsuits than Detroit. But each of those would have a different mean as far as what the average price of the insurance would be. So if you're working in a high crime place and the average price because of all the cases of the insurance is higher, the city covers whatever that mean is, whatever that average is. What about within a large city like New York where different neighborhoods are have very different characters? Maybe calculate the mean by precinct mm -hmm. assignment. Yeah. It's, a, it's definitely an I, interesting I idea. Ways, I think there's ways around to deal with that, mm. but qualified immunity isn't working. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think it's being apply, applied the way it could or should be. Um, if you do something that patently violates uh, your policy, then you should be on your own. 
not not splitting hairs. Maybe he could have. Maybe he didn't. If you just flatly uh, like the police officer shooting at the man who's running away, there's no policy in the country that was going to justify that. Then you should be on the hook yourself. Because with with the way qualified immunity is is calculated now, there's no personal liability. So if you could drive any way you wanted and somebody else would foot the bill, would people drive better or worse? Mm. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about um, before before I let you go. I want to talk about what makes policing in America different than policing in, in other nations, because I think a lot of people have noticed that, you know, America is the country erupting over these issues, um, you know, uniquely. It's, it's not a problem that we're seeing in Canada so much or Britain or our other peer nations in, in Europe. And the rest of the world looks on and says, what the hell is going on? Why can't you manage to stop shooting unarmed people and unarmed black people in particular? Um, and uh, I'll say my piece in, in a moment, but what do, you, what do you make of the international comparison here? Is, is, is there something to be learned from other nations? Is there something, some, some unique conditions in, in America that are making this uh, a, a more difficult problem? I think the biggest problem, when I worked in the UN, almost everybody I worked with in their whole country had one police force, the police. In America, we have, I think, 18,000 different police agencies. And I never realized how complex our policing system is until I tried to explain it to somebody who only ever knew one police force. And that decentralization has its benefits. It would almost be almost impossible to execute a coup in this country because no one person controls the police. But then no one person establishes guidelines and policy and use of force and uh, use of force continuums and training. And every department has it that does it differently. And this is a problem because there's no centralization. You can't standardize anything. Um, I think that's also been pushed by everybody trying politically to be the tough on crime law and order candidate means they they're not willing to go against the police and call the police wrong or restrict what the police can do, because that's a substantial voting voting block. So other countries can say, this is what we want for use of force, and it applies to the whole country. Mm. I, I know officers from countries that said, look, in my country, you practically have to take a bullet before you can shoot somebody. Mm. That's their standard. And that's why they shoot fewer people. But do cops in practice actually follow that? I mean, can, can they really tamp down the self-preservation instinct? Yeah, you know, it's... It's not self-preservation uh, per se. All right. This is one of, my, one of my hypotheses about all of this. When I teach use of force, one of the most important things I tell people is, well, let me ask you, how many recent shootings has the justification been the police thought he had a gun? They thought he was reaching for a weapon. They thought he was reaching for a knife. And what I tell police officers is if your explanation of why you did what you did includes the words I thought, then you're wrong. Because I am not supposed to apply deadly force because I think I'm supposed to apply it because I know. Now, when you get to that, then the answer I get back is, but that means they might hurt me. Yeah, it does. But that's what you signed up for. I've been hurt many times on the job, and that's what I signed up for. So if, you know, if a suspect is reaching in his car for his wallet and the police officer shoots him because he thinks he's shooting, he's reaching for a gun. What he's really saying is, because I have a dangerous job, you have to be more afraid of your interactions with me. Because if I think you're a danger to me, then I can take your life. And what's happening over time 
is that police are acting more and more out of fear, and they're actually shifting the danger of policing to the public rather than to themselves. I, you know, there are several times in my career that I had to decide whether or not to shoot somebody. And in each time I decided not to. And the best decisions I ever made in my career were the things I didn't do. We tend to think of good decisions as things we did rather than things we refrained from doing. So it doesn't mean that they can't defend their life, but you don't shoot someone because you think he's reaching for a knife. Maybe you draw your weapon, you give him commands, you give a reactionary gap. And if he has a knife, okay, that's one thing. You don't just shoot him because he has a knife in his hand. You shoot him when an attack imminent and you have no other alternative. I, I worry there's a survivorship bias problem. I mean, there, there's this problem in a lot of areas in life, but you know, so, something like 300 police get shot every year, according to the gunviolence.org. And some number of those are killed. And I, I just, I wonder if, you know, if their voices were included in the conversation, whether they would come to the same conclusion, right? Yeah, I, yeah, but that's kind of throwing a bit of emotionalism into it. You know, look, I, I, I was asked when I taught the police academy, aren't you afraid of getting killed? Yeah. Like everybody, I want to live to be 100. But if, if, if my time comes, my time comes. Would it be better for, and I think the average is between 30 and 50 cops get killed every year. So let's say 50 police officers get killed every year, but 40 unarmed civilians get killed every year. If 10 more cops got killed every year, but 20 less civilians got killed every year who were unarmed, is that equitable? It's a tough question. Very yeah, tough it, question it's to not easy. Right. No. Um, you know, but the officer accepts the risk of the job. The person I pull over, and, and I can't imagine what it is for black youth today, the fear of just getting pulled over. If he thinks you're doing something wrong, he can shoot you. That's to me, that's that's approaching police in the wrong way. So I, I don't agree when they say we thought you have to know. And if that puts you at a little more risk, it puts you at a little more risk. That's what you signed up for. Mm. And you see cases, you never see them on TV. But I see cases of police officers, uh, a Toronto police officer named Ken Lamb. Did you see that video? No, I didn't. He stopped a guy in a van and the guy was a terrorist. He had just killed a couple of people. And the video shows the officer. Uh, uh, aiming his gun across the vehicle and the suspect outside the van like this with something in his hand, but you can't see what it is. And the officer is giving him commands, but to the officer, just something about the totality doesn't seem right. So he refrains from shooting and he's still giving the guy commands. And then the guy does this a couple of times fast, like he's trying to get the officer to shoot. Now the officer realizes he's trying to commit suicide by cop. Mm -hmm. So the officer keeps his weapon on him, but he circles him until he sees what he had in his hand with a cell phone. Then he holsters his weapon, takes out his baton, and takes him into custody. That is a disciplined application of the use of deadly force. It all didn't seem right. And, and like I said earlier, just because you can doesn't mean you have to. Yes. Yeah, so I, when I hear that story, I draw a different lesson from it. I mean, th that... I, I wouldn't want to create a system that expects cops to have that level of restraint. I think that's what the public deserves. Hmm. It, it's, you know, for, for, I think I just have a different intuition about it because, you know, I, I certainly understand you're signing up for something when you sign up to be a cop, but the, the, the conversation is, is what level of risk is reasonable to, to ask someone to sign up for, given that we need, we, we need this job. We need people to want to be cops. Uh, we need lots of people to want to be cops so that we can have, we can pick the, you know, the, the very best. Um, 
And so, so the, you know, the more you dial up the knob on how much risk you expect cops to take on, the less attractive, it seems to me, you make the, the job of being a cop, which is not only bad for cops, but ultimately bad for society. And so it's, it's maybe we're setting that knob in, in different places, but, you know, it, it seems to me in suicide by cop scenarios, if someone's drawing something that looks pretty close to a gun and pointing it at, at you, you're right to shoot. You know, more, more than that seems unreasonable to me for 50000 a year or whatever the typical cop salary is. But my point is that officer had to have seen something. If, if he knew the guy had a gun, OK, yeah, I would shoot. And, and I think you're misinterpreting what I'm saying. Um, all right, I'll give you a, a classic kind of academy example. A guy is slow marching towards an officer with a knife. When he gets to a certain distance, the officer shoots him. The officer's not wrong. But could the officer have backpedaled away, given more commands, given a reactionary gap, given him more chances to 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 stop what he's doing? And there's actually a video of an officer that does this the guy's coming at him with a knife saying, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me. Mm. And the officer keeps backing up, backing up, backing up, backing up. And finally, the guy gives up. So there's a point where the officer can shoot him, but he doesn't have to. And what I'm saying is, uh, take Philando Castillo. He told the officer, I have a concealed carrier permit. I have a weapon. The officer's answer, I thought he was reaching for his gun. Why would I tell you I have a concealed carry permit and then reach for my gun? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a very clear case, I think. If the gun is in the holster, if the gun is in his hand, then that's the time to shoot. But because you think um, isn't, it, it, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not saying take incredibly crazy risks. When the elements are there, the elements are there. But what I'm saying is, when you think something, you have to show restraint until you know. Mm. If you're reaching inside your car and I think you're reaching for a gun, should I shoot you? Or should I wait to see what you come out with? That's the kind of restraint I'm saying, not let you fire at me three or four times and miss and then I can shoot you. Mm. Yeah. So how do you think, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot, uh, there have been a lot of people n- commenting about how little police get trained and how in, in certain cases, you know, there are, there are professions, there are licenses for totally mundane jobs that require more training than becoming a cop. So uh, what was the training like for you, for you to become a cop in, in your context? And um, how do you think training can be improved both in terms of the quantity of it and the type and quality of it? The, the whole academy that you go through, and it varies from state to state, so something like six months, they go through the police academy. And I, I used to tell police academy cadets, when you graduate this academy, don't think you're a cop. When you graduate this academy, you have the foundation of knowledge to start learning how to be a cop. The actual learning happens on the street. You learn by doing. You learn through field training. And if you're a good officer, you never stop learning. Um, So when you talk about police training, there is initial training and then there's in-service training. And in-service training is expensive because you're taking cops off the street. You have to put cops on the street to compensate for them being off the street. And whenever anybody gets a, uh, a budget crunch, the first place they go for is police training. Most departments... Actually, every department I've ever been in, you qualify once or twice a year and that's it. So there's not enough in-service training to keep people sharp, to to keep those things in their mind. And let me explain something about use of force. And, And this is what I think a lot of people don't understand. There is no mathematical formula for use of force. I can't teach you if A and B happen, do C. Because every contact I ever had in my entire career was different. So what you do in use of force is you teach the concepts of use of force, and then they apply the concepts based on the totality of the circumstances. I couldn't train you, hey, if the look in his eye changes, don't shoot. That's just what happened to me that one time. Mm. 
if the look in his eye hadn't changed, I would have shot him. Mm-hmm. How do you, you, you can't teach that. I had an incident where a guy was trying to run me down with a pickup truck. And in the half a second, I decided whether or not to draw my gun and shoot him. A thousand things went through my head. I can't teach you how to make that decision. I can teach you all the concepts and then you have to apply them in the moment. So teaching use of force is not as quantitative as people think it is. A lot of people think it's A plus B equals C and it's not, it can't be. Yeah. So, um, I was going to let you go earlier, but there, there's, there's so many interesting things to talk about. This will be my last question though. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now about substituting calls to the police for calls to mental health professionals in cases of, you know, where you have someone who's suffering some kind of mental health issue, having an episode And, you know, have you dealt with any of these kind of scenarios on on 911 calls in the past where it's immediately clear to you that this is not, you know, an otherwise normal but violent person doing something, but someone who has a condition? Every police officer has dealt with this. Uh, And I, I don't agree with that concept because what you'll wind up with is dead mental health workers. Okay, because the person is no less dangerous because they have a mental health issue. Right. And this is where I have issues with defund the police. The idea of defund the police, although I think it was horrifically named, um, is to take some resources for the police and start beefing up uh, like mental health responses in the field. The problem is for decades, police officers have been expected to be a marriage counselor a mental health professional, you know, child care. I can't tell you how many people wanted me to discipline their kids and scare the crap out of them rather than them be a parent and discipline their own children. So how about taking those responsibilities off the officer and augmenting them with that mental health presence? So let's say you have X number of mental health professionals who work every day on the street And when the police encounter that type of situation, they call and that person and the officer respond. Now the officer can ensure that the mental health person is safe and, you know, they don't get hurt. And if the person goes off the rails and starts killing people, the officer is there to take action. But the mental health person can apply their specialty and their skills and handle it in a different way. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it needs to be both. Well, on that note, this has been, uh, I think, the best conversation about policing I've ever had in my life. And I'm very grateful to you for, you know, coming on my podcast. I think um, people will find this to be more valuable than than you can even understand, probably. So uh, thank you so much for this and um, hope to speak again uh, sometime in the future. Oh, it was my pleasure. And, and I admire the way you think and the way you operate. Um, I, I say it tongue in cheek, but it's true. Politically, I'm a hardline moderate. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the answer is never at the polls. The answer is in the middle. And when I was younger, I used to hate extremists until I realized that we needed extremists because they define the parameters of the debate. But I believe the answer should never be ideological. The answer should be based on facts, data, and common sense. And that's where that's why actually I reached out to you because I I like that approach that you're taking and we need more of it. Mm. So it was my pleasure to be on here and and feel free to contact me anytime if I can help. All right. Thanks so much.